Guten Tag, this is Anton, and you're watching Foreign and Tunes. It is time to look at the wonderful history of animation in Germany, or how the Germans say it, Deutschland. While in comparison to the rest of the world, Germany didn't have as much of an impact, but that wasn't for lack of trying. We will be going over it all, from the abstract avant-garde to the Third Reich's attempt at making their own version of Disney, to the East and West styles, and finally to where Germany is today as a powerhouse in CGI animation. With that out of the way, let's have a look. The beginning of animation in Germany can truly be attributed to the avant-garde movement of the time. As animation was new and experimental, it only makes sense that it would be these people that would take up the mantle. Some were more abstract than others. Figures like Lothar Reiniger perhaps don't seem so separate from what we see today. That is animation that is narrative-based and aimed at children. Then there are more abstract, like Viking Egeling, a Swedish man living in Germany during this time. His films were far more abstract, being very geometric and, as he insisted, played only to the sound of silence. This period takes place between 1910 and 1933. Let's have a look at some of the first animated films. The first known German animated film was a short stop-motion animation by Guido Seber, named Die Geheimnisvolle Streichholzdose, or in English, The Mysterious Matchbox. It was made in 1910. The film begins with a man wheeling himself on the road. He then opens a box he has sitting on his lap and pulls out a bottle of alcohol that he proceeds to drink. Then another man comes up to him and asks him for a match for a cigarette. I think this meant to show that the man had matches in his box. Soon a crowd shows up and the matches on the box begin to move. What comes next is the actual stop motion with those matchsticks that arrange themselves into various shapes, including but not limited to a horse, a woman, a scale, a house and a dog. Nearing the end, the matches arrange themselves into more three-dimensional shapes, the last one being a windmill. The film ends with the matches igniting and the windmill burning down. This was the beginning of the animated film in Germany, or rather what came to be known in that time as trick films. What that basically means is films that perform tricks or what is now known as special effects. This film could be influential, or at least many people had a similar fascination with matchsticks. I say this because there are other animators who experimented with matchsticks, like the Frenchman Emile Cole in his short film Le Allumette en Sorcelle, or Bewitched Matches. What Guido was doing was entirely experimental, it didn't really pay the bills, so in the time from 1910 to 1920, animators like him primarily worked for ad companies making short animations with the products. Which was fine, as many animators were happy with the creative freedom that they had to do whatever they pleased. They never had to worry about anyone wanting to ignore their films either. In fact, most people went to the movie theaters for the ads, not for the feature films themselves. Experiments similar to this one occurred in Italy with Arnaldo Ginna and Bruno Corra as early as 1910 with painting directly onto film and a futurist manifesto mapped a blueprint for experimental film and animation to come. In two decades after this, important developments in art and design in Germany based around the Bauhaus movement led to a group of artists who pushed the boundaries of abstract animation and cast an influence that would still be felt almost a century later. Now you probably don't know what Bauhaus is. A lot me to explain. The Stadtliches Bauhaus, commonly known as the Bauhaus, was a German art school operational from 1919 to 1933 that combined crafts and fine arts. The school became famous for its approach to design, which attempted to unify the principles of mass production with individual artistic vision and strove to combine aesthetics with everyday function. In the 1920s, Germany became an incubator for avant-garde animated film, with boundary-pushing artistic movements such as Bauhaus and Dada. Germany was home to several experimental animators, including Walter Ruttmann, Hans Richter, Lotte Reiniger, Viking Egeling and Oskar Fischinger. They created a connected body of inspirational abstract work. Most of this group of animators, along with many other artists, left Germany for the USA or UK after the rise of Adolf Hitler and the National Socialists, but we shall get more into the Nazis a little later. 
with the armistice on the Western Front during World War I, Hans Fischerkosen began work on his expose named Das Loch im Westen, or The Hole in the West. He drew 1,600 individual images of his experiences on the front line and decided to make the film himself by building his own animation stand from an old wooden crate. The completed film was brought by provincial distributor and Fischer Kozen was on his way to making a career out of animated cartoons. It seemed to be lost, unfortunately, as I cannot find even a frame of this political cartoon. In 1921, Walter Ruttmann released his film called Lichtspiel Opus 1. Ruttmann was a trained architect and was also interested in shape, design and space. So he turned to cinema because he did not want to be constrained by a single static image. His desire to set a cubist painting in motion resulted in a series of abstract films he made in Germany in the early 1920s. In his workshop outside Munich, he made this animated film filled with triangles, circles, squares and ellipses, bubbles, globes and clouds and rhythmically flickering light and darkness music made visible. Ruttmann also crafted Opus 2, Opus 3 and Opus 3, all variations on the same theme. Interestingly, for an intellectual, an abstract artist and supporter of the left, in later life he wholeheartedly backed the rise of Hitler. In 1941 he died of wounds suffered while working as a war photographer. The Times of London had written in 1925 that Ruttmann's film would be long remembered and sure enough it can be said the small number of films cast a big influence over future abstract filmmakers. In the 1920s Fischer Kozen turned to making advertising films and had moderate success with the now lost Bummel Petrus or Strolling Peter. In the same year he made another three animated advertising ads, Die Entführung and König Krogs Löwenabenteuer and Professor Spreet, all of which also now appear to be lost. Regardless, the success back then led to a two-year contract with the animator Julia Springsever, who had pioneered the use of animated commercials in movie theaters back in 1911. Afterwards, he established his own studio to specialize in advertising films, something Fischer Kozen seemed perfectly suited to. After all, he had an irrepressible sense of humor, a good sense of rhythm and a charming, flexible cartoon style, as well as the obsessive concentration necessary to make animated films perfect in every way. Elsewhere in the country, Hans Richter and Viking Egeling befriended one another and began experimenting with animation in 1918. The two produced three early abstract animated films in the early 1920s, Rhythmus 21, Rhythmus 23 and Rhythmus 25. As you can tell, he added the last two digits of the corresponding year onto the title of each short film. How artistic! You can tell the guy had a big ego, as he later went on to incorrectly claim that Rhythmus 21 was the first ever abstract animated film, when in reality the Italian futurists Bruno Corra and Arnaldo Ginna had created experimental work in 1911, and Walter Ruttmann produced the previously mentioned Lichtspiel Opus 1 in 1921. As for Richter's three short films, there is nothing to write home about, as it is just various cubes and other geometric shapes moving, expanding and shrinking on the screen. This is pretty. In many minimalistic animations and the forms did increase in complexity through the series. In 1924, Viking Egeling, that is the strange Swedish man I mentioned earlier, decided to release a film of his own called Symphonie Diagonale. This film is silent and it is intended to be, with similar geometric shapes transforming, breathing in and out. You can't really make out what these shapes are supposed to be and that could be the intended purpose. The viewer is supposed to project their own impression on the patterns. At one point I see a man walking with a newspaper, though that may just be me. Egeling was unfortunately unable to attend the premiere of his own film due to illness and died six days after it was shown. There was one previous film created by him that was done in a similar fashion. In 1923 he showed a now lost 10 minute film based on an earlier scroll titled Horizontal Vertical Orchestra.
Europe's first feature-length animated film was produced in Germany. The Abenteuer des Prinzen Ahmed, or in English, The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, by Charlotte Lotte Reiniger, a paper silhouette specialist. She took her inspiration and motifs from the Arabic folklore collection Arabian Nights. It is also regarded as the earliest surviving animated feature film. In Prince Ahmed, a wicked sorcerer tricks Ahmed into riding a magical flying horse. The heroic prince is able to subdue the magical horse, which he uses to fly off to many adventures. While traveling, he falls in love with the beautiful princess Paribanu and must defeat an army of demons to win her heart. The entire film is animated using the silhouette technique, which employs movable cardboard and metal cutouts posed in front of illuminated sheets of glass. Reiniger's first love was the Chinese shadow theater, and she first used this technique in Das Ornament des Verliebten Herzens, or the ornament of the love-struck heart, in 1922. In 1923, with her film director husband Carl Koch, she started work on a feature-length film in the same style. She went on to become a central figure in the avant-garde movement, despite being distinct from her contemporaries due to her generally more accessible figurative style and more traditionally narrative-led subject matter. Her contributions to German animation made her a variable landmark. She set the tone for the future animation world by her desire to adapt fairy tales for the medium of animation. This would be seen later in American animation studios like Disney. In the same year as Reiniger's hit film, her conceited peer Hans Richter released his film called Filmstudie, or Film Study. While far more interesting than his previous work, it contained the combination of live action with animation. mixing surrealist imagery, disembodied eyeballs and multiple exposed faces with geometric animation. This was clearly a far more rich and dreamlike production from him. There were several stop-motion puppet films made between 1926 and 1935, all as advertising films promoting chocolates and cigarettes. Unfortunately, I cannot find some of them. The primary reason for this being that during the Allied bombing of Germany during World War II destroyed many things, including these artistic creations. However, Hans Fischerkosen began the ever-creative and hyper-focused man that he was, created many promotional films during this time. The History of Chocolate Casper, On the Ski Tour, For Your Attention, The Furnished Mister, and Noise and Smoke. He had very much success with these promotional films, making over 1,000 films during the course of his career. But unfortunately, all but a few of these seem to be lost, or language unidentified in collections that do not consider commercials important. Oh. 
Louis Sale, the artistic supervisor of Tobis Animation Studio, had this to say on the early period of German animation. With my return to Germany shortly before outbreak of the war, I was highly surprised that in Germany animated cartoons existed only as advertising films. Germany's creative and experimental animated film era lasted from the end of World War I through the start of the 1930s. With the rise of a National Socialist German Workers' Party in Germany, we would see an end to the era of abstract animation in Germany, as well as the entire avant-garde movement. This leads us into the next segment. Germany was at the forefront of animated film technology, but the avant-garde soon gave way to Nazi-sponsored attempts to rival Disney that didn't pan out quite as planned. With the election of Adolf Hitler and the National Socialist Revolution in full swing, all art that failed to meet the standards of the new leadership, in particular the abstract and modern, was branded degenerate. While most of the other abstract animators stopped work or moved abroad, some clever few like Oskar Fischinger were able to work around these new regulations by calling his films decorative rather than abstract. While being focused on advertising, Fischinger somehow still managed to make and even have approved by the authorities the abstract piece Composition in Blau or Composition in Blue. The basic composition of this film centered around solid objects moving about in an imaginary blue room. In the opening scene, red cubes are shown entering the room through a door, a mirror then introduced as the floor. It is certainly a lot more vibrant and creative than most of the abstract films from the previous period. An optical poem produced by Oskar Fischinger in 1938. Fischinger was a pioneer of what he had called visual music and always had the dream of combining classical music with the kind of conceptual designs that may be formed in one's mind when listening to a symphony. The first example of this was Studi, which was set to Liszt's second Hungarian Rhapsody. He produced about 11 more of these studies, each featuring a different work of symphonic music. The final thing I want to mention about Fischinger is he started creating advertisements that used animation to sell various products. One of the items he advertised is Murati Tobacco. In order to promote this product, he created the stop-motion animated short called Murati Greift Ein, or Murati Marches On. It features a pack of cigarettes that march with the precision of a crack German army. It was a very popular commercial and was allowed to run for over a year. Of course, this wasn't the only cigarette animation he produced. There are actually quite a few that he made over the course of his career. Kopet Murati Privat in 1935. Another small animator by the name of Kurt Stordel, who produced a German fairy tale based animation by the name of Purzel der Zwerg, which roughly translates to Purzel the Dwarf in 1938. Stordel was insistent on referring to the distinct German character of his style, as opposed to the grotesque American style of Disney. Grotesque in this context means fanciful or bizarre to the point of absurdity. Thus, Stordel's films were to be funny, romantic and folksy. The background of the individual sequences were rendered in grey watercolors to evoke soft color tones. The last abstract animated film that was shown in Germany was Tanz der Farben, or Dance of the Colors, by Hans Fischinger. Hans was the younger brother of Oskar Fischinger, whom we just spoke of. The pair had actually collaborated on the studies before the two fell over the never-to-be-completed Studi No. 14. Hans shared the similar talent of getting abstract work passed by the National Socialist government. His film was freely distributed in Germany, admitted by critics and audiences. It was the last film of the German abstract animation movement of the 1920s and 1930s.
Adolf Hitler and his good friend Joseph Goebbels loved animated films. One in particular was the animated film based on the old German folktale Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs by Walt Disney. Goebbels' diary entry from December 22, 1937 recounts how he gifted Hitler 18 Disney movies for Christmas. As Hitler was a big fan of Snow White, during the course of his art career he produced thousands of watercolor paintings, some of them even featuring some of the dwarfs from that film and Pinocchio from the movie of the same name. It makes sense, after all, as Snow White is based on the German fairy tale Schneewittchen. In his heart, he hearkened back to the tales of the simple Aryan folk. During a 1938 visit to Germany, Roy Disney sold the film to the Ministry of Public Enlightenment, one of 50 American films bought by the National Socialist government that year. Hitler wanted these films to be shown in Germany. However, a boycott of German films was soon introduced in the US, and the outbreak of World War II followed not too long after, in 1939. The government decided to stop showing Disney films in Germany and set their sights on boosting domestic film production instead. Now you may assume that because the government had banned most of these avant-garde animators, that animation was dead in Germany. But that is not the case. Germany from 1933 to 1945 produced more animation than people today realize. Hitler and Goebbels were especially determined that Germany should become a producer of internationally prestigious animation, similar to that of Disney. However, because Germany just didn't have the animation industry that the USA did, this did not happen. Most of the animators either did stop-motion animation or were abstract animators, so not very many cartoonists. So Germany never developed an animation studio to rival such American powerhouses as Disney, Warner Brothers or Paramount, but not from a lack of trying. There were individual animators raising money or trying to, to complete their films. Hans Hilt was one such animator who trailed behind him a long string of debtors. Even so, he was a tenacious man who was a dedicated actor in pencil. Early on, he realized the importance of movement as a means to express what he had in mind. To command movement was his main goal. Flying was his main interest. The scenes involving birds and wasps reveal the results of that interest. He created Der Störenfried, the troublemaker, in 1940. The film has clear militaristic tendencies. The hedgehogs wear spiked uniforms and Wehrmacht helmets, while the wasps make shrill Stuka noises while flying. Kann die deutsche Wehrmacht in der Realität beim Vormarsch an allen Fronten betrachten? They attack the fox in combat aircraft formation. The fox is reddish-brown in the color film and therefore in some post-war commentary is considered as a stand-in for the Red Army. The fable of all the forest animals banding together and fighting a common foe reinforced the Volksgemeinschaft ideology of National Socialism. The cartoon was aimed, of course, at children. Hitler youth members would have seen a poster in these years proclaiming throw all troublemakers out. Der Störenfried in 1940. But Goebbels wasn't very enthusiastic about the animation. He and Hitler continued to dream of Disney movies and the quality of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. A Berlin Dahlem based animation production on a small scale was founded in 1941 by the Ministry of Public Enlightenment and it was called Tobis Animation Studio. The leader was Louis Seal, who was summoned from Rio to Germany to take on this job. The scope of duties of this company was a production of an animation film about the mountain ghost Rübertzal. However, this plan failed because of the insufficient organization and the inability of the leadership. After this failed effort, Goebbels launched the Deutsche Zeichenfilm GmbH in 1941. He started what was supposed to become the major German animation studio. Ambitious plans to build a studio for 4,000 artists were made, and art classes were started. A sample cartoon was made called Armer Hansi, or Hansi, in 1942. 
It was about the canary who is enamored by a beautiful lady bird along with the outside world and goes on to escape from this cage. During this time outside he flies around, meets scary things such as this geometric kite, a gargoyle and other birds that are far too harsh to him. After failing to get his love, he returns with a newfound appreciation for his cage. Armer Hansi, 1943. <laughs> Plans for several more films were completed, but by the time the studio was ready to begin serious production, Allied bombing raids on Berlin made it impossible. Deutsche Zeichenfilm GmbH only managed to complete the one film, Armer Hansi, and to get partway through a second. Because of the war, the working groups were transferred to Munich and Vienna in 1943, where they were concerned with preparations for further movies, but there weren't more productions created till the liquidation of the Deutsche Zeichenfilm GmbH in October 1944, so it stopped with only one produced film. Goebbels legacy also included a mandate that new three-dimensional effects using model backgrounds be developed. Their stereo-optical process had used a rotating wooden set photographed behind the drawn cell animation to produce quote-unquote reality and an impression of depth to their cartoons. The short film Perwitterte Melodie, Weather Beaten Melody by Hans Fischer Kosen was created utilizing this technique. In the short animation, a bee dies from the sky and goofs around through the meadows. until she finds a record player to play music. The 3D effects are very noticeable, with not only the bee, but the fauna there as well as the record player. The various insects and small woodland creatures all dance about the music till everyone gets tired.
In that year, Fischer Cousins' Der Schneemann, The Snowman, came out as well and was one of the highlights during the time of the National Socialists and narrated the story of a snowman who absolutely wanted to see the summer. The opening sequence, as in Weather Beaten Melody, establishes the filmmaker's mastery of creating the illusion of three-dimensional space. Behind the credits we see layers of snowflakes, with their elaborate patterns falling down through the frame. As the credits finish, the viewer flies down over a snow-covered twilight village, around the steeple of the church, a stereo optical model like the record player in the previous film, down to a snowman in an open space, just as if seen from a snowflake's point of view. This point of view is confirmed when snowflakes alight on the snowman in the pattern of a heart, after which he goes on to frolic and do various wintertime activities. Before the end of the war, Fischer Cousin created one last animation named Das Duma Against Line, the Dumb Goose, in the last phase of the war. Through the bars of a wooden cage and a cart going across town, a young goose glimpses the seemingly glamorous allures of city life. an exotic parrot, silhouettes in a dance hall, and an elegant fox with feathers. Back at the farm, while her brothers and sisters receive their schooling in swimming, marching, laying eggs and such, she dreams by pond, swings on the gate like a parrot, uses the plot as a mirror, and creates for herself a costume by feeding and exploiting her neighbors. Her sachet through the barnyard creates mixed anger and astonishment. The gander, however, chooses to woo her instead of her more modest sisters. Although she rejects him and wanders off into the woods, where she is seduced by a fox.
The fox's sinister lair is run by slave labor, a weasel cranking a spit, a cat on a treadmill that makes syllophonic music with dangling bones and a cage full of geese waiting for slaughter. She manages to escape and the barnyard animals cooperate to drive the fox away and free his victims. While Allied troops invaded the beaches of Normandy, Hans Held still diligently worked on his project titled Die Abenteuer des Freiherrn von Munchhausen, The Adventures of Baron Munchhausen in 1944. He would hope to at least complete it as a short film. When he was summoned to the Eastern Front by the government, he took the course of action he did with his debtors. He ran away. He made his way to Amsterdam and thus avoided the draft. Not too long after, the Allied troops marched in and he was arrested. Nevertheless, his shirt was completed and released. The story follows one Baron von Munchausen. He gallops along on his steed, doing a variety of incredible things. such as sleeping clear through the winter, Pulling his horse out of the swamp by his hair, the color on this film pops out and you can clearly tell Held has improved since his last animation. With the surrender and following collapse of the Third Reich, animation in Germany came to a screeching halt as the Allies invaded and occupied the land. We wouldn't see a return of German animation till after the rise of the Berlin Wall. For this action, I've decided to divide German animation into two separate yet concurrent segments. As Germany was divided, so did animation. The East Germany taking a distinctly communistic philosophy and the West a capitalistic one. There is one animation that aired in both East and West Germany that is one of the longest television animated series, and that is Unser Sandmännchen, the Sandmännchen, Abendgruß, Sandmann, Sandmännchen and it is a German children's bedtime television program using stop-motion animation. The puppet was based on the Ol Lukoya character by Hans Christian Andersen. Two versions of Sandmännchen were created, one in East Germany, Unser Sandmännchen, and one in West Germany, the Sandmännchen. The original idea came from Ilse Obrich of West Berlin TV and radio station Zender Freies Berlin, who with the help of author Johanna Schuppel developed a working version in 1958. The little Sandman himself first appeared on screen in West Berlin in Sandmännchen's Grüß für Kinder, Sandmännchen's Greeting to Children, on 1st of December 1959, and other episodes were soon made. However, on December 22, 1959, less than three weeks after the production had started, East German television Deutsche Fernsehfunk DFF began broadcasting Unser Sandmännchen with its own Goodnight Children character, also called Sandmännchen. Sandmännchen, the little puppet who originated in the German Democratic Republic, GDR, 
and who first aired on Deutsche Fernsehfunk DFF on 22nd of November 1959 was indeed a true Cold War globetrotter. Not only did he throughout the history of the GDR wish all the children of his own country a good night, sprinkling the soft sand in their eyes to make them sleepy, but he also traveled to other countries and parts of the world. In the late 1960s he even ventured into space in a tiny cosmonaut suit and a futuristic spherical spaceship. Created by the puppet master and director Gerhard Berendt, the show represented everyday life, travel and fantastic adventure, as well as a certain amount of propaganda. Some people claim that the title character bears a resemblance to the then leader of the GDR, Walter Ulbrich, and the show was often a showcase for GDR and socialist technology and success. This is one of the reasons why he often arrived in awe-inspiring vehicles like futuristic cars and flying devices. The production of the western version of Zandbench and ceased in 1991, following the unification of Germany. However, episodes from the DFF show are still run on German television today. The East German Sandman supplanted the cruder version of himself in West Germany, becoming one of the few aspects of life in the GDR to survive in the reunited country. Partly because of government support and partly due to the passionate people involved in the artistic movement, East German animation was big and girthy compared to its anemic West German brothers and sisters. From 1946 through 1990, the Deutsche Film Aktion Gesellschaft, known more commonly as the DIFA Studio, produced thousands of films, documentaries and television shows for the German Democratic Republic. It was publicly owned and its films were thoroughly vetted and often censored by the Ministry of Culture, which would export them as exemplars of socialist art. Thanks to the Simpsons parody of Eastern European animation, remember Worker and Parasite? Many assume communist era cartoons to be uniformly grim, humorless and abstract. The Red Cartoons anthology paints a different picture, showcasing the various styles and thematic concerns of a group of artists who worked at East Germany's DIFA studio from the 50s until 1992. The 16 shorts on Red Cartoons come primarily from the 70s and 80s and average 3 minutes or less. Some resemble whimsical comic book one-pagers, others are more like editorials, and watched in chronological order they tell with wit and artistry the story of the mounting frustration in the GDR in the years before the Berlin Wall fell. That's only a fraction of DFAS output, which exceeded 800 cartoons, but this selection represents the impressive range of techniques and styles and showcases the animator's sophisticated drawings. Because socialist art demands realism, these works are strictly, albeit often fleeting, narrative, but they are rarely experimental and never pursue the form for its own ends. Still, these shorts possess a busy exuberance that makes them fascinating not only as historical pieces but also as lively works of art. Though each cartoon aims to make a point, some of these points are fairly benign. In Hans Moser and Thomas Rosie's Hello, for example, a man travels from the city to the country, to the mountains, to the beach, to the desert, looking for a solitude that proves less than satisfying when he finally finds it. And in Otto Sacher's Star and Flower from 1978, a man on the ground reaches for a star in the sky, while another man in the clouds reaches for a flower on the ground. Neither can grasp the desired object, and in all their striving, each destroys what the other wants. At barely five minutes, the cartoon constructs a bleak metaphor for divided Germany. Starting in 1975, the freelance artist Lutz Dumbeck, who created groundbreaking animated films that differed in style and content from the studio's other animation productions, though controversial to time, they are now part of animation history. The Moon.
the tailor of Ulm. I'm Art. The discovery and the flood. one of which Liv traces the story of man from birth to old age. The magical dreams of his youth sometimes appear, but daily routine quickly takes over. His striving for material wealth leads him to betray his youthful ideals. But others of these red cartoons have real sting, especially the work of Klaus Georgi and his occasional collaborator Lutz Stutzner. Georgi's The Full Circle is a bitter pill, depicting people wearing gas masks because of the pollution emitted by a gas mask factory. His consequence is even more savage, showing an audience applauding an anti-pollution film, then heading out to their exhaust-spewing automobiles. Georgi and Stutzner's collaborations, the breakdown and the monument take direct aim at the establishment. The former threw the absurdist image of a tiny car towing a convoy of bloated political leaders' vehicle, and the latter threw a lunette of a statue changing position after it receives a phone call from the party. And Stutzner's 1990 island joke exemplifies what these DIFA animators do so well by encapsulating the ridiculousness of a failing state in a scene of three freezing naked men using a bolt of cloth to make a flag that they can salute. Years later, it receives a phone call and shifts to point in the opposite direction, receiving just as many cheers as before. It's a damning commentary on the fickleness of the populace and perhaps a prediction of the coming events that would draw Germany together and ultimately shatter DIFA.
Now for the Western Germany, a fellow content creator who has done most of the research on this topic, Sensor Danon, will take over this part. Enjoy! In West Germany, unfortunately the animation scene wasn't booming, to say the least. While live-action film was certainly having a good time of things, animation was regulated primarily to promotional advertisements, of which most works were contributed by one previously mentioned Hans Fischerkosen. He was captured by the Soviet invaders and imprisoned on the suspicion of being a Nazi. However, he was released in July 1948 and fled with his wife and two children from the Soviet-controlled area of post-war Germany to the French-occupied sector in the West. In Melem, just south of Bonn, he founded Fischer Kosen Studios and resumed his successful career in the years of West Germany's so-called economic miracle, with ad campaigns for RL gas stations, the soft drink Africola, and the candy maker Harabro, he was able to reach an audience of millions. At festivals, his films were showered with prizes. He remained a successful producer of advertising films and commercials, but never returned to short film production. But that isn't to say that his work was not good. No, most of his work during the post-war period has been described as witty, lively, graphically interesting, and memorably clever. Certainly, he received critical acclaim. By 1956, he had won major prizes at commercial film festivals in Rome, Milan, three times, Venice, Monte Carlo, and Cannes. He also appeared on the cover of the prestigious Der Spiegel, Germany's equivalent of the American Time magazine. Fischer Kosen continued to make advertising films until 1969 and died in 1973. In a side character, Hans Held, the eccentric artist and animator, Held had a successful career as a graphic design artist, going on to create many designs for children's books, magazines, and commercials. Gerhard Faber, later joined by Heinz Tischmeier, went into a joint venture with producer Franz Thies and animated The Meinzelmenschen, who are six comedic cartoon characters used as mascots for the German public service television broadcaster Zweize Deutsche Feinzin, ZDF. They first aired on television in 1963 as a way to accommodate a government regulation disallowing confusion between advertising and commercials. The cartoon characters served as a transition between the two. They appear in between ads during broadcast, in roughly three to five second clips, and often during the satirical news program, Heute Show. The Meinzel Menschen have become quite popular across Germany. Radio dramas have been created surrounding them, as well as children's books and numerous other kinds of merchandise.
In 1981, a short film by the name of Crack by Frederick Back was released. Although German by birth, many of Back's films are examinations of the culture of Canada, his adopted homeland. Crack is an early example of the pastel shaded look that became popular in animation in the 1980s, in films such as The Snowman, 1982. Telling the story of a rocking chair through the years from its construction in the 1850s, this charming short film uses humor, imaginary sequences, and traditional music to show life and change in Quebec, Canada. Crack refers to the sound of wood being felled, and of chairs creaking and rocking and eventually breaking. Returning to the roots of the avant-garde in Germany, in 1982, the International Trick Film Festival was launched in Stuttgart. From time to time, some innovative shorts were released, including two stop-motion entries and Academy Award winners. Balance, 1989, by Christopher and Wolfgang Laurenstein. in which a group of fishermen on a precariously balanced platform fight over a trunk. Quest, 1996, by Tyrion Montgomery and Thomas Stelmacht, is about a sand puppet that leaves the sand world in which it lives. It wanders through other worlds made of paper, stone, and iron, following the sound of dripping water. In the end, the sand puppet manages to reach the water in a very tragic way. Back then, animated features were scarce, but became more common with the success of French-German co-productions such as Asterix and The Big Fight. It is a 1989 German animated film directed by Philippe Grimond and produced Produced by Yannick Peel. It was produced in Germany under the title of Asterix Operation Hinkelstein and is the first Asterix film to be produced outside France, which refers to it as Asterix et la coup de Manhir. It is based on the Asterix comic book series. The film has a different plot from the book of the same name. It combines plot elements from Asterix and the big fight, and Asterix and the soothsayer. Although there is plenty of fighting, as usual for an Asterix story, the specific fight that the book is named for is not part of the movie's plot.
With the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany, animation would continue to stutter on for another 15 years or so. In the meantime, here are a few of the films that came out in the 1990s. One of the first films created after German reunification was Peterchen's Montfort, Peter in Magic Land by Wolfgang Urichs, which was in development in the ZDF under West Germany. The synopsis for the film is as follows. After Zumzaman, the beetle loses one of his arms to a troll, he invites brother and sister Peterchen and Anneliese to join him on a journey to the moon in a quest to retrieve his lost arm. The Abenteuer von Pico on Columbus, or in English The Magic Voyage, is a 1992 German animated fantasy film produced and directed by Michael Schumann. It was released in Germany by Bavaria Film on 14 February 1992. In it, Christopher Columbus decides to go on a journey to prove that the Earth is not flat. His companion is a smart woodworm who's on a quest of his own to save a beautiful fairy princess from the evil lord Swarm and his insect army. In 1990, Werner Beinhardt, an animated adult comedy feature adapted from a popular German comic books by Rotker Feldmann, was produced by Gerhard Hahn Filmproduktion and Hamburg Strick Company. Popular in Germany, it was followed by two sequels, starring its beer-drinking biker anti-hero, including 1996's Werner Das Muss Kessel, or in English, Werner Eat My Dust. In the movie, Werner and his friend Andy waged their beloved pet pig in a race against the rich and snobbish Nobelschroder. Trick Company was founded by Michael Schack and has produced commercials, feature films and television series. In a similar broad comedy vein to the Werner movies was Trick Company's Kleines Arschloch, Little Asshole, in 1997. The story is about a small, short-sighted boy who politically and correctly terrorizes his environment in an old-fashioned, disrespectful and sometimes vulgar vulgar manner. Babar, King of the Elephants is a 1999 Canadian-French-German traditionally animated film directed by Raymond Jeffelis and made by Nelvana Limited, Homemade Movies and Two Loonland in association with the Clifford Ross Company. The film was released in theaters in Canada by Lions Communications and in the US by HBO Home Video. It is the second film based on John de Brunhoff's original book series following Babar the movie. The story chronicles the events of the first four Babar books. Another short stop-motion film called The Periwig Maker, set during a 17th century plague epidemic, a dark and highly atmospheric stop-motion short The Periwig Maker concerns a wig maker who is at first solely concerned with self-preservation as he observes the ghastly effects of the plague on the London street outside his window before his interest is drawn to the worsening condition of the small girl across the road. But I don't believe in this Turkish predestinarianism, where people think of the contagion being an immediate stroke from heaven without the agency of means. Without lessening the awe of the judgment of God, I am of the opinion that the plague is a distemper arising from natural cause. In the case of an infection, there is no apparent extraordinary occasion for supernatural operation, as the ordinary course of things appears sufficient. Written by Stefan Schaffler's sister, Annette, and adapted from Danielle Defoe's book, A Journal of the Plague Year, the film was narrated by Kenneth Brenner. 
The Periwig Maker was five years in the making, has beautifully crafted and highly detailed sets, and was nominated for an Academy Award. As you may have noticed, there are not actually very many films to show off here, according to Emily Christians of the production company Ulysses Films. In Germany, animation is still seen as something for the very young, says Christians. We definitely see the difference working with the UK, for example, where animation is treated with the same respect given grown-up films. Up until the CGI revolution in the late 1990s and 2000s, as said before, German animation was just barely chugging along. Even then you had some productions that were not so good to say the least. However, there were some very good entries during this period, such as Delivery. Created by Till Nowak, it is about an old man who lives a lonely life under the dark shadows of industrial smog. One day he receives a mysterious package which gives him the ability to change his environment. Delivery is a surreal story about change in a corrupt world. It presents a political message and innovative 3D designs alongside a strong emotional soundtrack. One cannot talk about German CGI animation without speaking of Reinhard Kloos, who is a live-action filmmaker turned CGI animation filmmaker in 2006 when he joined Constantin Film. One of the first projects he did for the company was Impies Island, which is a 2006 German computer animated feature film based on the children's novel Urmel from the Ice Age by Max Cruz. On a magical tropical island, a fun-loving group of misfit animals and people make a marvelous discovery. A baby dinosaur frozen since prehistoric times. Little Impy, as they call him, is loving his new family and ready to explore the strange new world. But when a king from the faraway country vows to capture the lovable baby dino for his private collection, all the inhabitants of Impy's island must join together to save their new friend. This was followed up by the animated film Impy's Wonderland in 2008. In the story, Impy, the friendly little dinosaur, and his friends join together in order to rescue their new baby panda, which was kidnapped by a man who wants to put the panda in his private collection. Neither of these films were very well received. Happily Never After is a German-American 2006 CGI animated film directed by Paul J. Bolger, produced by John H. Williams and written by Rob Morland. It is based on the fairy tales of the Brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen. The title is the opposite of a stock phrase, Happily Ever After. The name is contracted with an apostrophe between the N and the E. The film premiered in December 2006 by Lionsgate, and it was panned by critics and audiences, and it was a box office disappointment. The story is about an alliance of evildoers, led by Frieda, looking to take over fairy tale land. But when Ella realizes her stepmother is out to ruin her storybook existence, she takes a dramatic turn and blossoms into the leader of the resistance effort. The German production companies involved with this project were BFC, Berliner Film Company and BFA, Berlin Animation Film. Animals United is a 2010 German 3D computer animated adventure comedy film directed and produced by Reinhard Kloos and Holger Tappe. It was released in October 2010 in Germany. The film stars a meerkat named Billy and a lion named Socrates in the African Okavango Delta, who go on an epic quest to discover why the river has unexpectedly dried up. It is based on the 1949 book of the same name by Eddie Kessner. This is the second adaptation, as the first adaptation was a 2D animated film, which was also the first German animated feature film to be in color, that was released in 1969. <laughs> Thank you. 
Auf, nieder, 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 hopp, 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 hopp. The screenplay for the film was written by Oliver Husley and Reinhard Kloos. A group of animals waiting for the annual flood they rely on for food and water discover that the humans who have been destroying their habitats have built a dam for a leisure resort. Tarzan is a 2013 German 3D computer animated motion capture action adventure film written, directed and produced by German producer Reinhard Kloos, which was released on October 17, 2013 in Russia. The film was released in early 2014 in other countries. The screenplay was written by Reinhard Kloos, Jessica Postigo and Yori Brenner. Tarzan and Jane Porter face a mercenary army dispatched by the evil CEO of Greystoke Energies, a man who took over the company from Tarzan's parents after they died in a plane crash. The film is based on the classic book Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs and is one of many adaptations. Unfortunately, this movie has received predominantly negative reviews from critics and audiences. Der Besuch or The Visit is a short animated independent film by Konrad Tambor. It is a tragicomical story about an old woman who, to the horror of her son, is cooking up a meal in the middle of the night for her long deceased friends. But as soon as her son is gone, the guests actually show up. Fantasy, dream or reality, what is the difference when people get old? Pets United is a 2019 German-Chinese-British animated film directed and written by Reinhard Kloos and it serves as a standalone sequel to the 2012 film Animals United. A group of spoiled, selfish pets led by glamour cat Belle and stranded in their luxury hangout pampered pets. When the machines that run Robo City, the hypermodern metropolis that they live in, go wild and take over. The thief of Robo City came to my apartment last night. He's on his way to dog heaven. These pets are sicker than I thought. Yep. You're in grave danger. I've had enough. I'm granting you a whole hour to pack your bags and leave town. In 2020, Dragon Rider was created by Tomar Eshed. It is a story about a young silver dragon who teams up with a mountain spirit and an orphaned boy on a journey through the Himalayas in search for the Rim of Heaven. Nobody knows where they are. Job done. Go away, deep up. I'll eat it myself. It was an arranged marriage. Guys. It was distributed by Constantine Film, and the film is a German-Belgian co-production. Surprisingly, the film was a box office and critical success. It seems there is one last thing we've forgotten to talk about, and that is Maya the Bee. While originally starting as a book written by Valdemar Bonsils, it was eventually made into a silent film, which was not stop motion or animated. Instead, it starred live bees. It was called Maya the Bee and made in 1924. The film was lost, but found in Finland and restored in 2005 with a new soundtrack. The story is originally about Maya, who is a bee that is very adventurous and rebellious. She doesn't like the stifling order represented by the hive, so she chooses to leave the hive, which is a crime, and goes on adventures with the insects of the forest. Eventually she hears of a plan to attack the hive by the hornets, who are the mortal enemy of the bees. She has to make a choice on whether or not to let the hornets attack the bees unexpectedly or return home, face the consequences and be punished. She decides to return to the hive and once she warns them, she is unexpectedly elevated to heroine status. The reason Maya the bee is so popular and worth mentioning is because of a 1975 anime series adaptation called The Adventures of Maya the Honeybee. It originally aired on Japanese television in 1975 and was later dubbed into 42 languages and screened on television all over the world. In this post-war version of Maya, the militarist elements of the original book and film are toned down and new characters are introduced such as Willy, who is a lazy and quite unwarlike drone bee, and the ant armies who are hilariously incompetent. There was even a second 
second anime created called The New Adventures of Maya the Honeybee in 1979. This time, instead of being solely Japanese in its production, the Austrian and German Apollo film Dane co-produced the work with the Japanese company Vako Productions. The second series first premiered in Germany under the ZDF from September 1979 to September 1980. A very different and cartoon-like second series, which lasted for 52 episodes, was not very popular and did not premiere in Japan until October 1982. Being a cultural artifact of Germany, many drawings and merchandise exist of Maya the Bee, including video games, which for some reason this franchise has in spades. Seriously, there are eight games for the Maya the Bee franchise. In 2012, a new CGI animated series was created by Studio 100 Film and ZDF. They produced 78 episodes and two mixed reviews. It seemed that this time nothing could replace the old Maya. The series is of course about Maya and her insect friends. Aimed at toddlers and preschoolers, it covers moral lessons such as be a loyal friend and be true to yourself. The show is slow and easygoing enough for its target audience. It also teaches facts about nature in general and bees in particular such as where they live and how they make honey. Later on, a film series based on the CGI animated series and loosely based on the anime was made. In 2012, Maya the Bee movie was directed by Alexis Staderman and produced by Patrick Elmendorf and Thurston Wegener from Studio 100 Animation and Jim Valentin and Barbara Stephan from Bus Studios. The film was produced in association with the Australian Flying Park Productions and German ZDF. The film received mixed reviews and didn't really have much separating it from the CGI animated series as it was more or less just a summary of what occurred in the series. In 2014, the sequel Maya the Bee The Honey Games was released. It was directed by Noel Cleary, Sergio Delfino and Alexis Staderman. It was a German-Australian co-production, same as the last film. To give you a brief synopsis, when over-enthusiastic Maya accidentally embarrasses the Empress of Bastropolis, she is forced to unite with a team of misfit bugs and compete in the Honey Games for a chance to save her hive. Finally, in January, January 2021, Maya the Bee the Golden Orb was released. The box office successes of the first two films convinced the creative teams in Germany, Studio 100 and Australia, Flying Bark Productions to create a third film. The teams wanted to create another story under the guiding principle of friendship and helping others that defined the character of the protagonist Maya, but with a theme different from the first two films. Director Noel Cleary wanted to create a road movie where Maya leaves her home, Poppy Meadow, that additional involved high storytelling stakes. The theatrical potential of German animation is part of its core appeal for the global market. Thorsten Wegener, director of business operations at Studio 100 Film, notes that German animated features have positioned themselves in between the mega-budgeted studio animation of Pixar and DreamWorks and the majority of independently produced animated content, typically budgeted at between 5 million to 7 million, which can be a risky proposition for cinema distributors. While many of these animated films in the last 15 years have kept these companies afloat with mostly strong sales at the box office and abroad, it is fair to say that most of these films are boring, uninspired CGI fare for children. Germany has emerged out of a far more interesting era of avant-garde, cartoonism and socialist realism as a mediocre contributor in the world of animation. The writing was on the wall, so to speak. Most German animators were drawn primarily to advertisements. We could see this as a consistent theme throughout time. The eras that drew the most artistry out of animation was in the beginning with artists like Lotte Reiniger and the East German period with the likes of Lutz Dumbeck. Most German animators live abroad and do their work abroad. If we should ever see a return to a more genuine form of animation in Germany, it will be with new artists that work independently and not under any of these large companies. Long-suffering and often unrecognized are many artists throughout history and animators, especially of the German variety, are no exception. I hope you found some fascinating tales that perhaps pique your interest and maybe gain some appreciation for some old and some new works of art. I know I did. Till next time, you've been watching Foreign Untunes. Auf Wiedersehen.